Hello, my name is Rachel Donaldson, and I'm the Curator of Collections and Exhibitions at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. The show you're about to see is an episode from the program Port That Built a City, hosted by Helen Thielick Bentley. In 1945, Bentley relocated from Nevada to Baltimore, a move inspired by her immigrant mother's journey aboard a German steamship to America. After becoming a reporter for the Baltimore Sun, Bentley made a name for herself reporting on the city's maritime industries. Her syndicated column around the waterfront drew on a wide range of sources. She was as comfortable around longshoremen and union officials as she was with shipping executives and politicians. Named the Sun's first female maritime editor in 1949, Bentley's growing expertise led her to become the host and producer of the port that built a city in 1950. The civic pride that informed Bentley's waterfront reporting eventually led her into public service. In 1969, President Nixon appointed her chair of the Federal Maritime Commission. During her six years leading the commission, Bentley was a strong advocate for improvements to the nation's aging merchant fleet. Following stints as a magazine columnist and a shipping company executive, Bentley turned her sights on Congress and was elected to represent Maryland's second district in 1984. During her five terms, the Republican Congresswoman worked tirelessly on shipping and trade issues and secured millions of dollars to improve the Port of Baltimore. Bentley also backed numerous Buy American campaigns and could be, often be found driving across her district in an American-made station wagon bearing a Buy USA license plate. Although Bentley retired from public service in 1995 following a failed bid for Maryland governor, she continued to advocate on behalf of Baltimore's maritime interests as a consultant, and she became a board member of the Baltimore Museum of Industry. We hope you enjoy this fascinating historical look into shipbuilding at the Bethlehem Shipyards, formerly located on Key Highway in the city of Baltimore. Hello, I am Maggie Marsoff, Archives Manager at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Thanks to an IMLS grant and the incredible team at Henninger Media, we now hold a digitized collection of over 600 reels of film from Helen D. Bentley's Port That Built the City and State television series. In addition to the film, her collection also contains documentation from her time with the show, including scripts, show research and related notes, and photographs. The film you are about to see is labeled M34, Conversion of a Ship at Key Highway. Filmed sometime after the summer of 1954, we see and hear several interviews with managers and supervisors about the conversion of a Mariner-type cargo ship at the Bethlehem Steel Yards at Key Highway. The film provides an inside look at the ship converted through the hard work of 500 Bet Steel employees. This film shows only a small portion of the work that goes into ship conversions and shipbuilding. The film here is just one example of many within the collections of the BMI, which contain visual references to work and industry in Baltimore. In addition, we also have a ship profile plan of the President Hayes ship featured in the film. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact us. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for your support of the Baltimore Museum of Industry. The port that built a city and state. Behind the story of every great city are the factors that account for its growth, its wealth, and its business. Baltimore's phenomenal rise to the nation's sixth largest city is due to its majestic sweeping port that brings the four corners of the world across the oceans to every doorstep in Maryland. Today, Helen Dealish and Ad Wienert welcome you to another in the fifth annual television series on the port that built a city and state. We're going to give you the details of those later. And, of course, because the Mariner type ship is so new, no changes were made particularly in the hull and the bow, which remain the same. 
The Mariner type ships were conceived in 1950 by Vice Admiral Ned Cochran to provide the United States with the fastest and largest dry cargo ship afloat. The deadweight tonnage of the Mariner is 13,400 tons. Its listed speed is 20 knots. And the Mariners have gone up to 24 knots without any difficulty. The overall length of the ship is 563 feet. Here to tell us why this Mariner was converted in the Key Highway Yard of Bethlehem is Mr. William Reynolds, the manager of the Key Highway Yard. Mr. Reynolds, why is the Mariner here? In July of 1954, we were the successful bidder on the design and bid specifications which were asked for us by the American President Line and the Maritime Commission. After these were developed, the Maritime Commission and the American President Line decided to put them, the reconversion of these vessels out to bids on the West Coast, the Gulf, and the East Coast yards. <clears throat> in reviewing this with Mr. Willis, Mr. J.M. Willis, the general manager of this district, having a new construction yard at Sparrows Point and the repair yards here, decided that due to the declining of the new construction work at Sparrows Point, and with the chance of losing a large number of skilled mechanics, that we would have to take this work. With that, he instructed me to bid somewhat below cost, and we were the successful bidder. The first vessel arrived here in May and was delivered last month. This vessel will be ready for the loading berth on Wednesday of this week. The third vessel will, or the third vessel is the one that is arriving here tomorrow. The fourth vessel will arrive here in March, and with this work on hand, we have and will be able to employ from six, uh, around 600 men for 18 months. Of Many of those skilled, right? Of those men, there is between four and 500 which are skilled people, which Bethlehem and the Harbor of Baltimore would have lost had we not taken this work. At the present time, new construction is again developing at Sparrows Point, and these men, as the case arises, will be transferred to Sparrows Point and thus place them in a position to make the deliveries of the new construction vessels. It was a very wise move then in the beginning, wasn't it? Yes, it certainly was. On the conversion end of this vessel, uh, what has uh, your yard done? The main parts of this conversion, which add up to about $2 million a ship, was the conversion of some of the holes to carry 2,000 tons of special oils. They can carry 12 different types of oils, some in the number uh, one, which has five separate circular tanks, in number four, in number uh, six, and in number seven. You also have dry cargo uh, facilities uh, increased, haven't you? The dry cargoes have not increased, but they have been improved tremendously. And also, we have changed the refrigerated cargo space from 34,000 cubic feet to 55,000 cubic feet. Mm -hmm. I'd like to point out right now that they've done a tremendous job here in the installation of new cargo handling equipment to more efficiently handle the cargo. Thank you. And to tell us about those changes in the cargo handling equipment, we have Ralph Leaf, who's the technical superintendent here at Key Highway, and Bill Phillips, the superintendent of this particular ship. Ralph, what are the main changes in the cargo handling equipment? Well, primarily, the cargo handling equipment has been changed to what we call the Ebel gear. That was originated by Frank Ebel in the Maritime Administration. It's been tried on one ship before. The principal value of this gear is that one man, one man operating man, can raise the boom from their stowed position and place them in position to handle cargo. And then from that same position, this one man can unload the ship at each hatch. Uh, you mean by just sort of pressing a button, more or less, it can handle those winches that are alongside the booms and down That's on the right. deck as well? That's right. What's the point of having the booms, I mean the winches alongside the booms up there? Well, those winches are what we call topping lift uh, winches and bang winches. Those two winches handle the uh, top end of the boom so they're able to position it and handle the cargo at the same time. Um, is this the first ship, or are these among the first ships that have had this type of winch equipment on? Well, of course, the first ship we finished, the President Jackson, is now operating, but there was one ship prior to that on which this type gear was used just in an experimental 
away. But these four ships which we're doing are really the first uh, ships that are going to use the gear as a full-time operation. And of course, all that makes for faster handling of cargo. That's the main reason. Uh, Bill, what are the changes in the hold uh, that you've made on this President Hayes? Well, we've changed the lower part of number four hold to carry liquid cargoes. Number four, uh, of course, is where we're located. Where now. we're located, uh, such as latex, palm oil, and uh, vegetable oils. Over here, and look down in the bottom. Uh, you mean that previously to this change, you didn't have the deep tanks down there? Uh, no, that was just a dry cargo hull. And there are now four large deep four tanks. Four large deep one. tanks that can carry uh, oils and liquids for making plastics and such. Do any of your other holes have anything on this type? Uh, okay. Number one hole has uh, cylindrical tanks for carrying oils, and number seven tank has uh, flush deep tanks for carrying oils. And of course, deep tanks are necessary uh, in the Far East trade that this ship is going to be on. That's right. What about changes in any other holes? Well, we have a refrigerated number five hole for carrying uh, frozen products, uh, 50, uh, approximately 50,000 cubic feet of uh, space. Well, where are the refrigerated uh, holes controlled? I mean, is it all ice cold all the time, or can you uh, no, adjust you can the temperature? Adjust the temperature, any temperature you want uh, to below zero. And there's one other feature on the, the holes of these ships that I think should be brought out, and that's the way the hatches are handled? Yeah, they're mechanically operated by uh, using the winches to open them. In one operation, you can clear the whole hatch in a matter of uh, seconds. Uh, well, and even the ships are getting to the push-button world, aren't they? <laughs> well, I know that the shippers are most interested in the cargo carrying capacity and holds of a ship, because that's where the bills are paid and where all the m revenue comes from. But the general public always seems fascinated by the passenger quarters, and inasmuch as these passenger quarters have been made so elaborate, I think we'll take a glance at some of them. Elaborate is the right word, too, Helen. I'm sitting right now in the cloud room of this beautiful President Hayes. This is in the uh, forward uh, portion of this beautiful lounge deck that has been in installed and converted into this ship by Key Highway. And believe me, it is truly magnificent. It's comfortable, it's done in the most modern decor, and we're going to get into more details on its uh, air conditioning and heating and soundproofing and so forth a little later. Right now, I want you to take a look at what this vessel looked like about three years ago when the port that built the city visited it. At that time, the quarters were not nearly so comfortable nor so sumptuous. But they were, at any rate, truly basically comfortable. The appointments were colorful and simple. It was more than most American freighters offered their passengers, but it still did not meet up with the foreign flag vessels. Now, the cabins themselves each had two bunks. They were also comfortable, but they were rather small. The windows, you'll notice, were ordinary portholes. Here again, comfortable simplicity was emphasized in all of the appointments. And the same theme carried through to the dining salon. Minimum comfort and simple attractive decorations. The tables, of course, have the side guards on them to prevent foods from falling off during a storm. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Old types of dining salon and the passenger quarters. Then Captain Anglick, who's skipper of the President Hayes. Captain, I think you sailed on this ship in its old form, didn't you? I made 100,000 miles with her. And you see quite a few changes in it now? There's uh, many changes. Such as what? What are Such your principal ones? Such as the uh, lounge, the cloud room, the dining room, the passenger state rooms, cargo handling equipment, the most uh, modern equipment, cargo tanks. Let me ask you this question. When you took the Mariner out or the Mariner type ship out your first time, did you think that there were any improvements that could be made at that time? At that particular time, no. I guess you're quite amazed, aren't you? Yes. Stuart, you're the one who's going to be living in this dining salon, or it's going to be under your jurisdiction. What is your opinion of its utility and its colorfulness? I think it's uh, quite advanced in uh, ships designing, and in dining room style, some board ship. How many people can you serve in here at one time? 32. 
Uh, well, you only have pa 12 passengers. Why so many? There are 16 officers and two cadets who also eat at the same time with the passengers. Oh, on the American flagships, the passengers and the officers all eat in the same place. On a flight of passengers, yes. I see. And I'm going to uh, mention the coloring in this dining salon because I think it's so pretty. There are different shades of blue and gray, and the flooring is of white, gray, and blue. It all blends in beautifully with the sky and the general tone of the ship, which is carried out in Indian colors. Uh, Stuart, why don't you and I go in and look at one of the passenger cabins that the captain mentioned a second ago? That's it. With me now is Dave Seymour, the naval architect of Key Highway. He had the responsibility, incidentally, for the overall design of this converted mariner. And we're going to uh, take the time to look at some blueprints right now and point out to you in detail exactly where these sumptuous quarters are located. Dave, that, uh, all of these uh, luxurious passenger quarters are located in this area, are they not? That's all right, Ed. The dining room is on this deck here, the cabin deck, and the passenger staterooms are just forward of that. Where are we standing? We're standing right up here in this lounge, which is up on top of the flying bridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, forward of this area here is the mesa or cloud room or That's whatever right. you call it. That's where I was a little bit earlier. And down the center runs your elevator shaft and your uh, smoke stacks, your stacks and, and everything. Ventilating ducts and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, it's truly uh, an unusual design. What I did want to find out was whether any of this was here on the Mariner before you began to work on it. Uh, yes, Ed, the first four decks, uh, uh, which are from the main deck up, were uh, on the original Mariner. Uh, however, they were completely altered to uh, accommodate the more spacious uh, crew quarters and passenger quarters. And of course, this lounge deck uh, was a whole new deck added on top. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go uh, below right now to the cabin area and see what the inside of one of these truly luxurious passenger cabins really looks like. We were talking about color in the dining room, and I'm going to go right into color here. The decor here is sand with different shades of yellow and orange, and it's very bright, and again, it fits in with the old Indian thing. Stuart, uh, how does the size of this lounge or this cabin compare? It looks like a lounge to me, it's so vast, with the old Mariner cabins. I would say it's about 50% larger than the old type cabin. Well, where did they find the space for all this? Uh, there was an entire new deck built for the passenger accommodations. Also, there was a new deck built on top of the bridge for the lounge. Oh, so that gave them enough space all around for them. There two complete decks. More. There's one thing special in the passenger quarters I want to point out is each one has its own radio on a freighter, and each one has its own telephone. And I'm told that you can just lay right here in your cabin, way out on the high seas, and call up all over. Uh, and each one has its own private bathroom, and this one happens to be decorated in pink, but unfortunately our camera can't go in there. And now we're going to go back up on the next deck to the sky room and see more of the details there. Dave, uh, we're sitting now in the uh, after portion of this uh, beautiful passenger lounge, aren't we? And uh, I noticed that the decor is very subdued. It's uh, soft, uh, sandy colored. Yes, uh, the, uh, the basic uh, motif here is uh, Southwest American Indian. And uh, the colors are the sand painted colors used by those, by the natives. Mm -hmm. Let's get up and uh, look around a little bit. As you can see, the furniture itself is very modern in design. All of the fabrics and the rugs, hand-woven rugs, blend in with this basic southwestern Indian design. And over here we have uh, what we like to uh, look upon as one of the most unusual features of this entire room. These are Cochina dial dolls, aren't they? Cochina dolls, uh, they were, uh, they're all handmade and authentic Indian dolls that which were used in a, in a native dance by the Indians of the, of the southwest. Mm -hmm. And that certainly sets off uh, this room, does it not? It does. Now, down these two aisles here, we have, uh, we were in one aisle when we were showing the folks the blueprint, and that contained the recreation area, didn't it? A right. color television set you have installed and a hi-fi hi unit. And down this side is the card room and bar, and correct? Bar, right. Well, it's truly, truly luxurious all the way uh, throughout the entire area. Now, it's soundproofed overhead, I see. That is right, Ed. It's soundproof there. It's air-conditioned completely and uh, special lighting effects as well. Mm -hmm. 
and the it's draped right at the present time around the entire glass That's enclosed right. area. That's right. And uh, also air conditioned yes, and it's heated. It's air conditioned with all all year round heating and cooling. Uh, and it's uh, there's also all of the furniture that you see here is all uh, special built. Uh, for the comfort for of the, the comfort of the pastor for the overall design. Well, now let's go out on the deck and uh, find out just where this luxurious vessel is going to carry these uh, 12 passengers uh, in the future on the first round-the-world trip. Uh, Captain, what are some of the ports of call that these ships will be making? Well, we have three different lines. The Trans-Pacific Line from the West Coast to Japan and Manila, the Philippines, and back. Straight Atlantic one from New York and the East Coast to the West Coast to Indonesia and back. And the around the world one, all the way around the world. And these four special Mariner converted ships are going to be on that round the world They're one. They're going to be on the round the world one. Uh, of all those ports of call, which is the most fascinating to you? I believe the round the world one is the most fasc fascinating to me. What's your favorite port? San Francisco. <laughs> Always home. Uh, this outside passenger deck, incidentally, is on the same level as the sky lounge and the cloud room, so you can just walk from one to the other. I imagine, Captain, you're going to be spending quite a bit of time out here. Uh, quite a bit of time, I expect. Will the officers be able to come up here, all the officers with the passengers, or is it limited? The officers will be able to come up here. Maybe you can answer one question I've always had, and that is, why on American freighters, where they have passengers, do the officers and the passengers mix, whereas on foreign ships they seem to draw the barrier? Well, that's probably a custom of the land, of the country. Uh, Captain, of course, all ships have essential parts to keep them going. The passenger quarters are beautiful, and the cargo uh, capacity and the holds are necessary, and of course that's where all the converted work was done on this particular ship. But they have to have engine rooms, I believe, <laughs> to keep them going, and of course the radio shack. And we haven't gone into so much detail on those because no converted, no conversion was done on them, but it is important that we take a glance at the radio shack as it was on the old Mariner and also on the present engine room. The same radio equipment is aboard. It is the best, of course, that RCA has available. And, of course, meets every requirement of the Coast Guard. Right now, Mac and I want to turn this program over to the man who is, I guess, most proud of this conversion. That's Mr. J.M. Willis, here of the Key Highway, Bethlehem Steel Company. And here he is, of course, my very good friend, Jack Willis, who's the Bethlehem general manager of all the shipbuilding in the Baltimore area. Mr. Willis, I know you're very proud of these particular ships. Helen, I'm sure uh, naturally proud of this ship, as I am of all ships that are turned down by the great Bethlehem organization in the Key Highway and Sparrows Point Yard. It just shows the fine workmanship of our skilled, outstanding mechanics employed in our shipyards in Baltimore. Let me ask you a question that I asked the captain. Did you think when you built the Mariners three or four years ago that anything more could be done to improve them? Why, really, I did, Helen. I felt that the Mariners were susceptible to transfer into all types of high-class ships, such as passenger ships and AKAs and special ships for the Navy. Um, and it won't be long, of course, two or three or four more days before your yard is finished with the President Hayes, and she will go on out, as did the President Jackson only last week. Just before we see the, uh, last month, before we see the Jackson leaving, I want to introduce the man who was superintendent on that particular job, Warren Chandler. Don't go away. Uh, I know, Mr. Chandler, that maybe you're a little envious of this job. No, the Jackson was just as nice as this one, looked just like this one. They're all nice. <laughs> we like them all. And we will now watch what this ship will be like in about five days as she's bidding goodbye for her first trip away around the world from the Port of Baltimore. As is typical of any ship in a ship repair yard, the skilled craftsmen work up until the last minute. The owner always wants to get the vessel away the second the workmen are through.
As the Jackson pulled away, Jack Willis stood proudly at the pier, watching this most modern of freighters take out on her adventures around the world. Here was truly a work of art, produced originally at the Sparrows Point shipyard with the finishing touches to make it more up-to-date, topped off at Key Highway. Having seen how the Baltimore, the skills of the Baltimore shipyard workers are applied, we're now going to give you a word from our sponsor of the day. As the President Hayes and other great ships of the future enter the port of Baltimore, those workhorses of the waterfront, the powerful tugboat fleets will be on the job. Aboard the tug itself, one is keenly aware of the effect of development and expansion around the port. For as more and more ships move into the harbor, the tugs must be ready to handle them, maintaining a steady flow of world commerce. This week, a new and powerful addition to the fleet of the Baker Whiteley Towing Company went into service. This new arrival, the Tug Holland, represents the latest result of an expansion program costing over a million dollars, begun by Baker Whiteley in 1946 to provide the modern equipment necessary to perform all towage services efficiently and economically. Day and night, the untiring efforts of the mighty tugs go on thus helping this port maintain its record of fast, dependable service. Baker Whiteley has had the privilege of contributing to this record for nearly 70 years and dedicates its future endeavors to the protection of this record and the position of leadership enjoyed by the Port of Baltimore. Well, Helen, it's been a most interesting and breathless program. I just finished running up from, uh, let's see, how many decks down? Six decks to get up here in time to uh, speak for our sponsor of the day. Well, I know that anybody who is worried about their calories, all they have to do is do one of these shows, one of these remote telecasts, and they won't have to worry any longer. <laughs> I'm beginning to think you're right. Incidentally, uh, what do we have planned for next week's program? Next week, we're going to do a phase on cargoes. See, boxes, bottles, and bags is what I like to refer to it, the three Bs. Three very important items in shipping. Mm -hmm. After all, if you don't have the bags, you can't send certain cargoes, and likewise bags and, bo bags and bottles. And boxes. <laughs> and boxes. Uh, yeah. And the raw materials that go into all three of those items that are brought in by ships, and many of the finished products are taken out. Just another series of industries that are tied into the economy of this port. Very definitely. And those three industries are three of the larger ones in this whole metropolitan area and throughout the state of Maryland. And I think that's uh, a great lesson to be learned from our telecast today, the fact that uh, with the conversion was made here in the port directly affected the income of, uh, I guess, 500 people and indirectly maybe 15 several or thousand. several thousand yeah. more. Because of the materials involved, you take your rugs and all the other items that are involved, it goes into thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Well, before we leave you for today, I think I want to pass along one final reminder to get in on our Port of Baltimore essay contest. Right. Remember, if you don't have particulars, you of high school or junior high school age, please write to Helen Dealish in care of WMAR-TV Baltimore and she'll be delighted to send all the applications to you. See you next week. Right. Until then, speaking for Helen, the entire remote and camera crews of WMAR-TV, this is Ad Wienert saying good night. Baltimore, Port of America, Port of the World, and intrinsic part of the economy and protection of your city in mind, of your state in mind. That port which is directly responsible for the employment of 90,000 persons and the indirect employment of 300,000 more. This port serving the entire nation, in all probability, is responsible for your livelihood, either directly or indirectly. It is part of your life from the minute you awaken in the morning until you go to bed at night, whether you are a salesman, architect, doctor, or typist the hub where world commerce merges. These leaders of Baltimore industry have joined together to tell you, its citizens, about the greatness of our state because of the greatness of this port. It is through the civic spirit and cooperation of these outstanding Baltimore industries and merchants that this series, The Port That Built a City and State, is brought to you for the fifth successive year at 4 o'clock every Sunday afternoon.
report to build a city was originated and produced by Miss Helen Dealey, maritime editor of The Sun, narrated by Ad Wienert, and directed by Edwin B. Mick. The film portions were produced in the studios of WMAR-TV by Ed Eisenmeyer and Bill Payne. Dick Smith speaking. WMAR TV, Sun Papers Television, Channel 2, Baltimore. We actually have several of the uh, ship plans for the SS President Hayes that's being discussed in the Helen Bentley video. Um, this one in particular is the capacity plan, and um, it shows all the different types of information such as the stores, uh, deep tanks, fuel oil and ballast, and dry cargo. Um, along with it, we have the profile views of each level of the ship. Uh, of course, beginning at the top and working its way down to the lower levels. All of these profiles and plans are immaculately drawn. Uh, with detailed information about what was in the ships and how they were structured. Hello, my name is Ami Gellis and I'm the Community Programs Manager at the BMI. Thank you so much for joining us this evening to watch this recently digitized archival footage. Tonight's program is part of Steel Weekend, a celebration of steelworkers organized by the National Museum of Industrial History in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. We'll also be hosting a virtual conversation on photography of Bethlehem Steel this Friday, October 14th on Zoom. You can find out more about that program on our website, thebmi.org, and Steel Weekend programs at nmih.org. If you'd like to learn more about Baltimore's steel industry, I invite you to check out our website, for more about the Bethlehem Steel Legacy Project. You'll find our blog with personal stories about living and working at Sparrows Point, as well as the award-winning podcast, Sparrows Point, an American Steel Story, produced by Aaron Hankin. And if you haven't seen it yet, I invite you to come to the museum to check out our newest long-term exhibition, Fire and Shadow, about the rise and fall of Bethlehem Steel. The museum is open Wednesday through Sunday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Thanks again for joining us this evening.